Uh, all right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, first, let me just say uh, thank you so much to Kramos for speaking to us from uh, Toronto. Um, Kramos, I guess, had to get up a little bit early. He's going to tell us about uh, uh, hierarchical expander decompositions, which leads to a lot of interesting dynamic algorithms. And also, Kramos has just done a lot of uh, amazing work on, on dynamic graph uh, algorithms. Um, and he's going to be moving closer to us soon. We uh, just saw on the website uh, to, to University of Glasgow. So that's very exciting too. But uh, Gramos, thanks, thank you. And I'll just let you, you start. OK, great. Thanks a lot for the introduction, Rasmus. And let me just share the slides. And in the meantime, I'll just say people should feel free to ask questions in the chat, and I'll try to pay attention to it and, and help, uh, you know, read the questions out to you. So, so. Okay, sure. Yeah. Okay. So does everyone see my slides? I think now we do, yes. Okay, great. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, for the introduction and for inviting me. This, uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, expander hierarchy and the, their applications to dynamic graph algorithms. So this is joint work with Harald Reke at Technical University of Munich, uh, Thatcher Ponsaranarok at the University of Michigan, and Zihan Tan at the University of Chicago. And let me start by this simple idea that you usually see in uh, graph algorithms, and this has been used almost everywhere. Uh, so now, let's say you're given a graph, and let's say you want to solve a graph-based optimization problem. Uh, most of the graphs that we deal with, we don't really understand them, but let's assume that uh, you know how to solve the, the problem, this graph-based optimization problem, on a tree. Trees are much simpler to deal with, right? And you know, one question that you might wonder is like, how can I use this tree solution to solve the problem on general graphs, right? And one way to do this is to basically take a graph approximated by a tree while preserving some property that you care about, and then try to map the solution back, this tree solution to the original graph. Okay, so this is a paradigm that has been used a lot in algorithm design. And let me just tell you about a few examples, some of these you have seen and some maybe not. For example, uh, the most elementary ones are connectivity. So if you wanna preserve connectivity, then you can do this with the spanning tree or forest. If you wanna preserve the shortest path from a source to everybody else, you can do this with a BFS tree or shortest path tree. If you want to preserve a pairwise min cuts, you can do this with the Gomery hood tree. Uh, another example is the so-called FRT, FRT trees or Bartle trees, where they allow you to preserve pairwise distances in expectation, or low average spanning trees that allow you preserving um, distances on average. So in this talk, I will mainly be focusing on tree and cut flow specifiers. So you can think of these as trees that preserve the cut and the multi-commodity flow structure of graphs. Okay, so before I let you know what a tree and a, flow, a tree flow and cut sparsifier is, let me look at this problem and tell you a bit about it. Uh, this is called a congestion minimization problem. It's a multi-commodity flow problem, which you define on graphs. So what does this mean? So I'm given a graph G, so for simplicity, assume it's undirected and unweighted. So now I also have a demand function D, on, uh, uh, which is defined on pairs of vertices in the graph. So this means like every pair of uh, vertices in the graph wants to send some flow through these endpoints, like for example, two endpoints U and V, okay? And this full mount low, uh, flow can be either, uh, can be non-negative, and so it can be either zero or something strictly positive, right? So let's talk a bit about how do you satisfy this demand? So you satisfy this demand using routing. So what is the routing of a demand? You can think of a routing of a demand as a multi-commodity flow that you define in this graph. And this multi-commodity flow that you define needs to send D of UV, units of flow from U to V. In, in this case, we say that D satisfies, so sorry, F satisfies the demand D. Or we can say that F is a routing of the demand D, okay? 
So now, once you have done this uh, uh, definition of what a multi commodity flow F is, you can ask what is the amount of flow that you send along an edge. So as you see in this graph over here, so if I send a flow along uh, this uh, blue path and and um, and then if I send flow along this other color here, then you see you have some congestion here, okay? So you have congestion of two. So there are two flow paths that use this S twice, okay? So by F of E, I mean, what is the amount of flow that you send along the IG? And then I can find the congestion of routing this uh, demand D as the maximum congestion over all edges, okay? So what is the congestion minimization problem? Here, given the simple graph, and uh, since we have also defined the routing, the goal is to find a flow F that routes this demand D and minimizes the congestion, okay? And uh, throughout the talk, I will denote this by congestion of this demand, uh, congestion for routing this demand D in the graph G. Okay, so this is the abbreviation I will use throughout the talk. Okay, so once you know what a congestion minimization problem is, I can tell you a bit more about what uh, tree flow and cut specification is. So here the idea is as follows. I'm given a graph G. This graph is simple and unweighted. I would like to find a tree, and this tree can have weights. It's, so it's a weighted tree, then the graph doesn't have weights such that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the vertices in G and the leaves of this uh, tree T. And for every cut in G, so for every subset of vertices in G, so the cuts in the tree dominate the cuts in G, okay? So they are larger. And the second property is that these cuts are not far away from the real cut in G up to an alpha approximation point, okay? So this is the definition of a cut sparsifier, tree cut sparsifier, and it's called a sparsifier because I'm also like trees are sparse. So I'm also like sparsifying the structure of the graph, even if the graph G is dense. So what is the definition of flow sparsifier? So now that you know what the congestion minimization problem is, you should be able to understand this definition. Now it says for every demand on G, so you, don't, you are not given the demand in advance. For any demand, this has to work. It means that I, the, the tree T is a flow sparsifier. If I can route every demand that I can route in D, in G, sorry, I can route in T. So everything I can route in this graph, I can route in the tree T. And everything that you can route in the graph uh, T, you can route with uh, alpha congestion in the graph G back. Okay? So this is the definition of, of a tree flow sparsifier. In other words, uh, this tree flow sparsifier is a better network because you can route more stuff in it, but the congestion for routing an arbitrary demand in T is not far away from routing this demand in the original graph G. Okay? And obviously the goal is to find sparsifier that minimize this quantity alpha, which, which is called the quality of the approximation, or the quality of the sparsifier. Okay? So this is a very powerful object in approximation algorithms and in designing uh, very fast uh, graph algorithms too. It has been introduced in the context of oblivious routing schemes. And uh, for example, using similar approaches, the best known approximation algorithms, for example, for minimum min bisection, min max graph partitioning actually are obtained using this technique. And more importantly, for example, the, the best known approximate max flow papers uh, so for th that use uh, congestion approximators, so, so this is also so called sometimes congestion approximation, use this kind of tree cut plus specification. Okay, so let's look at this problem a bit. Uh, what has been done? Uh, so it was introduced by uh, Reke in 2002. So he showed that uh, there exists a tree flow cut specifier and you can construct it in exponential time. And then there were two concrete works uh, achieving polynomial time. So this work of Biankowski and others had worse approximation uh, guarantee. And this one is like low squared and log log n. And then there hasn't been much progress for probably the last 10 years. And then in 2014, uh, Eric and Shaw showed that for three cut specifiers only, this doesn't work for flows. You can get this two down to three over two. And more importantly, which is used in this uh, approximate max flow techniques, 
is that if you have quality polylogarithmic, uh, then you can actually achieve nearly linear time. And this was shown by Raquel Shaw and Toybik in 2014. Okay. So we also know that there are lower bonds for this problem. So there exist families of graphs, I would say. So these are like a family of grids such that any tree cut specifier of GN must have uh, uh, quality at least logarithmic in the number of nodes. Okay, so essentially uh, this problem is not yet closed, I would say, but so it's tied up to polylogarithmic factors and fairly well understood in the static setting. Okay. So now we look at the dynamic version of the problem. So what does it mean? Uh, so I'm given a graph G. It can be empty, it can have uh, some edges in the beginning, it doesn't really matter. And there's an adversary that keeps inserting and deleting the edges from this graph G, okay? And our goal is to come up with a data structure with a dynamic graph algorithm, which is called, this is what is usually called, that can actually take this updates, edge insertions and deletion, and also update the tree flow specifier that we are maintaining accordingly. So what do I mean by updating the tree here? By updating, I mean I am allowed to add new nodes or delete or remove edges or insert new edges depending on how my algorithm works. But at the same time, I must ensure that T is always a tree, right? This my, my specifier is always a tree as the underlying gra graph uh, undergoes updates. And ideally, I would like to minimize the update time, which is the time to handle edge insertions and deletions. And at the same time, I want to ensure that T at any point of time has small quality. And by small here, I mean polylogarithmic or subpolynomial, as, as you will see soon. Okay, so Carlos, this is the problem. Uh, yes. We got a question in the chat. Can a single tree be a good cut uh, approximator or does one need a distribution over trees? A single tree can be a good uh, cut approximator, just a single tree. Here, I'm talking only about single trees. I, but uh, after I, after the presentation, I'm happy to discuss uh, about distribution of trees and why is this different than everything. Okay, thanks for the question, Zoran. Uh, Goran. Okay. So what do we show in this paper? So we show that you can design a tree flow specifier satisfying the following properties. I can have quality which is uh, sub-polynomial, so it's not polylogarithmic, unfortunately. The construction time is m times m to little one, so it's, I would say, pretty competitive, right? Uh, but again, it's not um, nearly linear. But in addition, uh, we can maintain this tree flow specifier dynamically. So previous works are only static, so we can maintain this dynamically. And we can do this in very fast time, update time. So this is antelitical one. And moreover, our algorithm is deterministic, doesn't use any, uh, any randomization, and it's worst case for update time. So this meaning that like you don't need any amortization, you don't need to talk about adaptive or oblivious adversaries or anything. Okay? So it's, it's a very powerful result in, in these realms, except that here the quality of the approximation is not as good as we would like to. So the main technique, it uh, maintains some sort of expander hierarchy under edge updates. Okay. So let me tell you briefly about the implications of this result. So one implication, why we care about this is fully dynamic max flow. So max flow is a cornerstone problem in opt uh, combinatorial optimization. And there has been a lot of work trying to actually bet the best uh, running time for computing max flows in graphs. There is still ongoing work in the static setting. The problem hasn't been settled, uh, settled uh, depending on the setting you're looking at. But here I would like to summarize what's known about the fully dynamic version of the Maxwell problem. So I must say that uh, there has been some work on the problem, not uh, as quite as I would like, but for example, uh, in 2004, Italiano and others showed that you can get sublinear update time, namely m to the two thirds, if you have exact approximation, so like your queries will be exact, but they must assume that the graph is planar. Okay, so they explain planarity and some sort of like duality between distances and cuts in planar graphs, which you don't have in general graphs. 
Then also there are like lower bounds telling that you uh, telling you that if you want exact approximation, then you cannot get sublinear of the time. These are conditional lower bound based on the online uh, multi spectral multiplication conjecture. Um, you can also get something for dynamic max flow if you maintain a dynamic classifier, which is a sparse representation of a dense graph that preserves the cuts, and you can maintain such objects dynamically due to the work on Abraham and others. So here you can get approximation one plus epsilon. The update time is pretty fast, competitive, it's polylogarithmic, but the query time doesn't go below uh, sublinear for sparse graphs. So for dense graphs, you get something non-trivial. For sparse graphs, you don't get anything. Okay, so now here, uh, there, there's also been some work on actually obtaining polylogarithmic approximation with very good competitive update time. But the query time here is also, sorry, the query time is also competitive, but this work assumes insertions only, okay? So it doesn't allow the algorithm to delete edges, which is a, a, a something disadvantaged, I would say. And uh, in this work, we show that uh, you can get antilogical one approximation, the update time is antilogical one, and the query time is logarithmic. And so there is also a concrete work where um, myself and Thachapon are also uh, included and involved. So there we show a fully dynamic algorithm for max flow with a nearly logarithmic approximation in n to the two thirds update query time. This one is based on distribution of J trees. So uh, going back to the question that uh, Goran had, so this is based on the power distribution of J-trees, achieves slightly better approximation, but the running time is slower. But of course, I'm not gonna go talk about this in this talk, but just so you know, there is also this other work on dynamic max flow. Okay, so more applications of this results. Um, what we can show is that you can maintain sparsest cut dynamically, you can maintain lowest conductance cut dynamically, you can maintain multi-commodity flow, multi-way cut. All of this you can do it with one approximation and query times are always of the order uh, logarithmic and update times is still polynomial. You can also get the first algorithm for maintaining tree width decomposition and constant degree graphs. And you also can use this framework to simplify connectivity, dynamic connectivity, which is one of the central problems in uh, dynamic algorithms. So just asking whether the graph is connected or not, there is a very natural algorithm based on what you're going to see today in this talk. So finally, I would like to mention that uh, our notion of uh, strong expander decomposition has been leveraged by the recent work of Jason Lee, who manages to show a deterministic algorithm that runs in almost linear time for computing mean cuts on weighted graphs, and which is essentially uh, doing a, a randomization, de-randomization of the Cargo's uh, classic result. And yeah, this is very exciting. And uh, hopefully after you see this, you would probably be equipped to maybe see other applications of this technique as it seems very powerful. Oh, so, okay, so let me give you a brief overview of oh, what I'm gonna talk next. So how do we uh, obtain this dynamic tree flow specifier result? So initially I start by giving an algorithm, a static algorithm to construct a tree flow specifier. So this is based on uh, a stronger notion of expander decomposition called well-link, boundary well-link decompositions. And once you have this, then it's very natural to actually uh, do a expander hierarchy and then uh, just get tree flow specifiers as a result of this expander hierarchy. So why did we do all this work? We did all this work because this gave us a nice way to, to construct a tree flow specifier, which can be maintained uh, dynamically easy, or like fairly easily, a module of some technical complications. So what we do is basically the whole idea is how to maintain this well-linked expanded decomposition dynamically. So then we show how to do this, and this will rely on dynamic pruning and extensions of some previous works and so on. So let me just point out that in this talk, I will not give a lot of details about how the will linked expanded decomposition is actually constructed inside. Like this is based fairly, I mean, it's fairly standard in cut matching gaze and trimming. There are complications where we need to achieve this, but I would like to keep things more 
conceptual. And also, I will not talk about specific implementation of how do you maintain sparse scattering on a tree under edge updates and so on. This you can all do with some uh, technical work. Uh, what I try to convey here is like what you need to obtain such a result. And also like the simple applications of how do you maintain dynamic max flow or dynamic connectivity, which are like immediate corollaries of what we obtain here. Okay. So let's start talking about an important notion in, in graphs and in many areas of uh, mathematics, which is uh, expander graphs. So here you can, you can think of it in many ways. So one, one way I would like to think about it is that if I, if I have a graph and if I look at any subset of vertices in the graph, the, the boundary of that graph is comparable to the size of, of this subset, okay? So in math terms, this means that for all subset of vertices, such that the volume of S is smaller than the volume of the complement, uh, the number of edges that leave the cluster S, okay? So th these edges, these red edges that leave S, is at least five times the volume of S. And what is the volume of S? So I look at all the, uh, so I look at all vertices in S and then I sum their degrees, okay? so it's roughly the size of S, right? So in proportion to the number of edges that I have in S, okay? So again, an expander is just like, I look at a boundary of any, any cut in my graph and I would like that to be fairly large compared to its size, okay? And, and expanders are, are, are great. They are very, very nice. They have been used all over the place. For example, we know that they exhibit these great properties. They don't have any small, cuts. They have very, they, they are high, highly connected structures. Uh, from an algebraic point of view, they have large second eigenvalue. If you want to do something with distances, we know that on expanders, you have small diameter. If you, if you do random walks on grass, we know that they admit a very fast mixing time. And from a, a sparsification point of view, they are very easy to sparsify. So a si very simple random sampling approaches work for ex expanders. So, and if you would like to know more about expander graphs and their application in theoretical computer science and uh, graph algorithms or dynamic graph algorithms, uh, I would refer you to these great videos by Avi and touch upon on YouTube. So why did, do I started speaking about uh, this? Uh, why did I start speaking about the expander graphs? This is because construction tree and cut flow sparsifier and expander is uh, quite straightforward. So this is uh, this is a place where you I would like that you pay attention and then you will really understand this proof because it's very elementary and very easy. So let's say I have a phi expander and my claim is that there is a very easy tree which is simply a star with one extra vertex that is a tree flow sparsifier with quality uh, roughly one over uh, phi, okay? So how does this work? So let's say I have this graph G. G is a complete graph. We know that a complete graph is an expand, okay? So what I do is that I take all these vertices of G, so I put them here as leaves, and then I also construct one uh, node. I add one node, which is an auxiliary node. This is not the node that corresponds to any of this to any of the vertices in G. So, and then I add an edge between every vertex in this tree to the root of this tree, the root of the star. And the way that I put there is just degree. Okay. So now I need to show that this is a tree flow sparsifier with a clean quality. So the, the proof goes as follows. There are obviously two directions here. So, and first let's show that this is a cut sparsifier, okay? So you fix any subset of vertices and then you assume that the volume of S is smaller than the volume of, of its complement, okay? So what is the cut in G? It's just the number of edges leaving the set S, right? And obviously the number of edges leaving the set S is smaller than the volume of S, right? And actually this is tied when S is an independent set or S is in a single, right? So obviously we have this inequality that cut uh, in G is at most the mean cut in T. Why? Because the volume of S is exactly the cut you obtain for the set S in, so 
to obtain a cut in, uh, for the set S in the tree T, you just cut these edges, right? So if I have this, uh, if I had these two vertices as my set S, I just cut these edges. And this I get like sum of degrees, okay? Now for the other direction, so we, we just showed that the cuts in uh, the tree T dominate the cuts in G. For the other direction, we use the expansion property. So by rearranging this inequality of expanders, we get that the volume of S is one over phi times the number of edges leaving S, okay? And then we argued that the, the volume of S is exactly the value of the cut in, in the tree T, and the, the number of edges leaving S is by definition the cut in GS, right? And then we get that the, this is one over phi. So how do you get a tree flow sparsifier? So this gives you a tree cut sparsifiers. How do you get a tree flow sparsifier? Well, you just pay a log M, a multi-commodity flow, max flow, min cut gap for flow sparsifiers. What does this mean? It means that uh, in the single, uh, so a single commodity problem, we know that ST uh, max flow and min cut uh, are the same, right? But if you talk about multi-commodity flows where many pairs of vertices are sending flow, then we know that uh, they, are, they are off by a log factor, okay? So if you show me a cut sparsifier, just by paying a log, I can immediately get a, a, a tree flow sparsifier, okay? So any cut sparsifier uh, with the quality one over phi is a log m over phi flow sparsifier. Okay, so this is essentially the proof, that's it. So in expanders, three cut flow sparsifiers are trivial. So now the next question is, what about general graphs? And well, obviously, uh, expander decompositions, right? Uh, well, you will see not so obvious anymore. You need more work, but. Okay, so let's look at what an expander decomposition is. So it's just a partition of the graph into a bunch of clusters such that each cluster is an expander and the number of edges between clusters is bounded by this um, phi m. So each cluster, each induced cluster is a phi expander. The number of edges crossing uh, the cluster is phi times. Okay. And it, this has been used on and off in many uh, variants and papers, but I'm just referring to this phi expander decomposition from the recent work of Saron and Rakim Vang, who showed that you can find such a decomposition of graphs in times m over phi, and you can I think we lost the slide share for some reason. OK. Sorry. I don't know why. Do you see it now? Uh, not yet. OK. Do you see it now? Yes. Okay, yeah, great. No, Sorry, I don't know what happened. Okay, so then uh, once you have this definition, then you say, why don't I do the, the following algorithm? By the way, the following algorithm is inspired by the work of Alon, Karpeleg, and West in term, uh, what they did in terms of low stress spanning trees. So they have uh, low diameter decompositions, they contract, these small uh, diameter clusters and recurves, okay? So inspired by this, we said, why don't we do this for expanders? Uh, it's kind of surprising that until now, nobody did this, but yeah, we, we consider this. So basically the idea is simple. It's fairly straightforward. You compute a, a phi expander decomposition. You compute a weighted star for is, which was a tree flow sparsifier for each of the guys inside, right? And then you contract everything into a single vertex and you recurse on the remaining graph until you, you exhaust all. You, you keep recursing until your graph is of constant size and then you stop, okay? So this is like one attempt in doing expander hierarchy. So let's look at, uh, like, uh, let's look at this picture and try to get a more uh, be, like a better view at what's going on. So I did expander decomposition in this graph. I constructed this weighted star that I told you before. And now, now I contract each of the expanders into singletons. And 
Now, these actually, the singletons are the roots that I use for each of these stars, okay? And I do another expander decomposition on top of this. It happens to be just a single vertex, okay? And then I just connect these three vertices to this single vertex here, and I'm done, right? In addition, I'm making this very strong assumption that after I did the contraction, this graph here is an expander. This you don't necessarily have, but let's make this assumption for the sake of analysis, okay? As I'm trying to tell you things. And then we will see that you will not need that. Okay, so this gives you the hierarchical uh, partition of the graph, and it, it's also known as the bottom-up clustering. So contract and then recurse on, on the rest. So let's look at uh, what about the quality of this tree as a flow sparsifier. Okay, so now uh, th here, there, here is like the place where things get a bit more complicated, but uh, to be able to understand it, uh, it it's, it's not so hard. So I'll try to explain it to you. Okay, so now routing in the tree is fairly easy, right? You route along the shortest path of the tree, okay? So the direction of saying that, oh, this tree is a better network, is fairly straightforward and uh, just follows from the way how we set capacity. Remember, we just set capacity, what is all the number of outgoing edges, right? Here is going to be parallel edges, but doesn't matter. Just the number of outgoing edges, degree in that vertex set. Okay? So now, now let's look at the hard direction. The hard direction is showing that the quality is somewhat bounded. Okay? So let's, let's assume I have a demand that I can route with congestion one in the tree. Okay? So now when I, so pick, so like routing in the tree is just a long shortest path. So I want to write the demand back uh, in G with bounded congestion, okay? So one, one thing is here, which is important is like to basically partition the demands into different parts. What does it mean? So I can, I can partition my demand as like demand w w that I have to route inside these blue clusters. Okay, and this is called the source demand here. This is the other one is called the target demand over here. Okay, so this source and target demands are fine. I can route with uh, them with congestion log m over phi, and I showed. And why is this the case? Because I just replaced these are expander. I replaced them by a star, and then I can do this with log m over phi. So the tricky ones are these one these demands here on the red edges. Okay, so. On the red edges, I know I have a cut sparsifier or a tree flow sparsifier. So this demand over here that is uh, induced here in this edge, in this edges, I know that this is of order log m over phi or something. Okay, but the problem that I have is like how to route this demand now inside these clusters, the blue clusters, because routing this demand here in this graph doesn't correspond to routing a demand in the original graph. So because I'm routing uh, along these edges which are contracted, okay? So this is the, this is the complicated part. So routing these demands on the, bond, like on the boundary edges, it's not clear how to do, okay? So now you can see that by routing these demands, it means like I will have a clustering, uh, sorry, sorry, I will have a flow problem induced on the boundary of this cluster, okay? So I'll have to route demand from one endpoint uh, here to another endpoint here and so on, okay? So I'll induce a flow problem in the bond, on the boundary, and this flow problem on the boundary tells me that I need to route k units of demands for every edge, actually, in fact, because of the congestion guarantee that you get from one level up, okay? This is called boundary induced on the demand. So far, just if I do expander decomposition, and just contracting things, I have no guarantee whatsoever that I can route with small congestion on the boundary. So actually, just by doing this, the quality of your flow sparse fire is horrible. You don't have any guarantees as bad as M. And then any tree is as, as bad as M, so you just try, take any tree, okay? So doing expander decomposition and uh, like just contracting naively doesn't give you anything, okay? 
just because you don't you don't need to be able to route only in the bond uh, only inside the cluster you also need to route demands on the boundary and these demands of the boundary are sort of like uh, expensive and you don't know how to do this here okay so let's look at the second attempt let's look at this notion of expander decomposition so in addition i require that i have this cluster and these edges that are leaving the clusters these red edges okay now for every edge in the cluster i i make a self loop okay so this is the notation we use like G with curly braces U, UI is like the induced subgraph where every boundary edge is a self loop. Okay. In fact, this work of Sarnarak and Bang can give you a stronger expander decomposition. They guarantee, in fact, that you can find a phi expander decomposition such that this degree preserving induced subgraphs is a phi expander. Okay. So now this allows you to route boundary demand with congestion log m over phi. And, and you will see why log m over phi squared. Uh, why? Because now you are like, by, by saying this is a good expander, I can also route flow not only inside, but also I can route flow on the boundary edges inside the cluster, okay? So by making sure that I'm including these edges, by ensuring that this set of vertices is expanding well, I can make sure that I can solve the, this uh, induced flow problem from higher levels in 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 this uh, in this graph. So log m over phi, one log m over five you get from the congestion from the other level, and log m over phi you get the, from the congestion that you you ensure that this is a good expansion. Okay. So this is an, uh, a second attempt of solving this problem. It seems promising, but. Uh, now I wanna I wanna be mean and I don't wanna say that you know after I contract the graph uh, this is an expander right because that's like that's not gonna happen with my graphs so I want to say that no this is not gonna happen you have to repeat this until you adjust the graph so your graph is of constant size right so if I go back uh, this means that I have to repeat this uh, so I I do expander decomposition I contract and I repeat this uh, for t steps. And this quality grows multiplicatively with the uh, depth of the hierarchy, okay? And uh, the quality of the flow sparsifier, tree flow sparsifier that you get is gonna be of order log m over phi to the t. So if you set t to be something of order log one, so base one over phi m, you have to, because this reduces by a factor of phi uh, in each iteration, uh, the quality can be as high as m. So Still, we haven't done any good here. So let's look at the uh, third and the last attempt of, of getting things right with expander decompositions. So now what we do instead, we say, what about looking at this? So let G, U, this be the new subgraph where every boundary edge is now replaced with alpha over phi copies of these self loops, okay? So for every edge, I have alpha over five copies. Okay, so now when I look at this uh, boundary demand that I need to route inside the cluster, now I can route this with a following congestion. This log m over phi I get from the higher levels. So this log m over phi I get because this is a good, con uh, this is a good, uh, it expands well. And this alpha over phi, so now I divide by alpha over phi, I get from these copies that I added, okay? because I ensured that the larger set expands well. And this is where they, this, uh, this more self loops actually help me with congestion. Because you can think of this as I, I sort of have more, uh, more pipes uh, connected to this. So, so that the flow that, that comes here can be redistributed among these copies, okay? And now uh, obviously I can cancel one over one over five here. And what I get is that I pay log m over five for the first time I do this expander decomposition, but each other time I just pay log m over alpha. And we will see that alpha and phi are very different. And this will help us get a sub-polynomial uh, uh, sub polynomial quality, sorry. Okay, so the advantage here is again that you only lose the log m over alpha in the quality per level in the hierarchy instead of losing log m over phi, which was not enough. 
Okay, and you. So now the question is, okay, very nice. You add copies and you make uh, things work. Uh, great, but like, do such things exist? Like, can you get such expanded decomposition with these guarantees? I mean, that's like the next question you have to answer for being able to make use of this technique. And this is what we precisely show. We show that you can get an alpha phi expanded decomposition. So given two parameters, alpha and phi, you can partition the graph into disjoint clusters, and you can do this in m over phi time, such that now every induced subgraph with self loops on the boundary, uh, as uh, what I explained before, it's a phi expander. So this is much stronger than just saying the induced subgraph is a phi expander. And still, the number of edges uh, across uh, leaving. Uh, so the number of intercluster edges in this expanded decomposition is bounded by phi times n. Okay. Uh, again, so why why are uh, why is this so powerful as a tool? So it is because it tells you two things. The first thing it tells you is that on the edges inside the expander, you can roll with congestion log m over phi, and this we showed before when we had the expander case. But more importantly, it allows you to have the second property. Also, if you have demands uh, which are induced on the boundary by, uh, by other levels in the hierarchy, right? So you can route these this demands uh, inside. Uh, okay, so if you have this demand, you can route these demands inside the cluster GUI with congestion log M over alpha, not over phi anymore, okay? So by having alpha phi expander decompositions, you have this very well linked uh, expanders, okay, that can route very efficiently on the boundary or with good congestion. Okay, so as a byproduct of of this tool, now it's trivial to actually get the expander hierarchy. This is the one that we so, tried to actually do before. Yeah. Can I just uh, read, so we had a question again in the chat. Is, is there some dependence on alpha? Like what prevents us from setting alpha very large? Goran was asking. Is there some dependence on alpha? Why wouldn't just set alpha to be super large? Uh, we will set alpha to be something like one over polylog. Okay. And phi is going to be- But can you set uh, alpha? One over no, I don't think you can set alpha to be very high. So there, there is like uh, there is bonds that, uh, that don't allow you to set alpha very high. Okay. Because uh, like um, this alpha, you will pay, right? You will pay with a number of levels, right? So uh, you you need to if you set the alpha very high, then they will, this would give you a very bad ap approximation, right? And the number of levels you also have to keep low, uh, sort of like square root of log m or so. And we will see. I will do some like hand waving analysis about that. Okay. Okay. So once I have this alpha phi expander decomposition, then I can. Given a graph G, I can compute a tree flow sparsifier with quality until it's all one and uh, in almost linear time. Okay, so as I said before, and let's uh, reiterate here, it has larger quality and worse running time than what's the best known. But one uh, th good thing about this is it's quite a simple construction once you believe that you can do well linked expander decompositions which hopefully I think the techniques right now maybe are not as easy, but maybe like, um, you know, there is room for getting much simpler algorithms. So once you have an alpha phi expanded decomposition, you could just make a hierarchy and like construct free flow sparsifiers. This is fairly easy compared to the other constructions, which are unfortunately very complicated. And on top of this, you can also make this dynamic. So what is my hierarchy now? I just compute an alpha expanded decomposition. Uh, I compute a uh, weighted star for each of the of the guys on on this induced subgraphs, and I let GU be obtained the graph 
GSAB will be, be the grab by contracting each of the clusters into a single vertex and they are recurse. So this is our final explainer hierarchy, right? So let's look a, a, a bit about uh, how, what is the quality that you get from the sort of hierarchy of the tree flow specifiers. So obviously this generates a sequence of graphs, like G0 is my original graph, then GI is just a contraction of the previous one and so on, right? And GT probably is like just empty or like constant size, doesn't matter. Ooh, now we ha we lost the slides again for some Yeah, time. I saw it, I saw it. So I uh, it should be back, okay? Is it back? Yeah, it's back. Okay, great. So now, so observe that uh, the guarantee was that the number of intercluster edges reduces by a factor of five. Then this gives you that a per, per level, I have like a five reduction. And then this also gives you that the depth must be something of order log uh, base one over phi m, right? Uh, obviously. Now, if I look at the quality, what is the quality of the tree flow specifier? This actually you can show inductively. I showed you two levels how you get this, and then inductively you can, uh, you can uh, do the, the same. So just let me tell you about these two terms. This log m over phi you get by initially replacing everything by an expander here, so the, fir the very first level. And for all the other levels that you have, you pay this log m over uh, alpha, uh, this all raised to the t. So uh, like uh, answering uh, Goran's question here, so you you have to so if uh, alpha has to be polylogarithmic somewhat and t also has to be something of order square root of log n to get something of order n to little one, otherwise you wouldn't be able to get this. Okay. So if you said uh, if you said if you choose this phi to be one over n to little one, and alpha to be one over polylog n, this yields um, a flow specifier with. Uh, a guarantee like with quality until the one and a running time almost there. Okay. And so the running time is, it just follows from the fact that we can compute expander decompositions efficiently. And then we are just doing square root of log n of them. So this is, it's trivial. Okay. So, so far, what I told you here is all about static flow specifier. So let me tell you something about the making these things dynamic. So what do we prove? So we prove that given a graph G, there is a deterministic fully dynamic algorithms that maintains a alpha phi expander hierarchy in subpolynomial worst case update time. Okay, this is what we prove. So what are the implications of this result? So if you think about the dynamic connectivity, so what you need to do is just check whether the, the tree that you get from this expander hierarchy is connected and that's trivial. So you, this gives you a very simple algorithm for dynamic connectivity once you know how to do uh, alpha phi expander decompositions. So even for connectivity, you even don't need this, but I'm not gonna talk about it. But for max flow, you, you need this. So for max flow, this gives you an algorithm of the following form. Just maintain a dynamic tree flow specifier. Whenever you ask me about what is the uh, max flow between u and v, I just go on the tree. Tree has bounded depth, which is bounded by log n. Then I just compute the max flow on this tree. And we know that that's easy. You can do this in logarithmic time, okay? And this, like, these are like simple implications of this result that uh, allow you to solve important problems in combinatorial optimization in the dynamic setting. So what are the key techniques? Um, the key technique uh, here, the first one is I want to maintain uh, expander decomposition dynamically, alpha phi expander decomposition. And the second technique is I want to bond recourse. So what is recourse? You can think of recourse as the number of edge of days that you propagate to the next level in the hierarchy. So now remember, I had a bunch of uh, expander, expander decomposition on top of each other. If I change one of them, I will have updates to, to the uh, other ones in the next levels or the levels below me or above me, depending how you see it, okay? So this notion of recourse is really important to make sure that you get competitive update times, okay? So let's first look at how you maintain a dynamic uh, expander decomposition. 
And you do that using pruning. So what is pruning? Pruning is the following process. So as you delete edges or insert edges in the graph, maybe insertion is not a problem, but it depends on how you view it. But okay, so let's assume I have only edge deletions for now. Um, you can have edges uh, that you are removing, actually, adversary can remove edges from the expander, right? And at some point, you fail to be uh, an expander. So you, the expansion property will be violated. Okay, so what, what do you do in that case? So where here's the, when the pr pruning comes in. Uh, the pruning tells you that you can actually, as this happens, you can uh, grow a set, a set P, which you call the prune set. And what you do is that you can also make this spoon set to contain this edge, uh, the, the deleted edge. And then you can guarantee that if you prune out this uh, part P from the expander, the remaining part here is also a good expander. By a good expander, meaning like your quality goes down by a bit, but not by too much. So here we have a factor of 38, but it's, not, it's a constant, so you, we can somewhat massage this, okay? So if you get another edge deletion, then this set, the prune set, keeps growing and growing, so that it always ensures that the remaining part is a good expander, and so on, okay? So now, okay, initially this prune set is empty, obviously, and then as you have uh, edge insertions and deletion, it keeps growing. So it grows very slowly because the volume just increases by one over five with the number of updates that you do to the expander. And also has this property that once you, the, the, the proof set is kind of like sparsely connected inside the expander, okay? Which is this property. And the third property that you need is also, th this is also important for uh, bonding the recourse is that your set, the prune set is also not very badly connected to the outside, to the outside graph, right? Because this is just some cluster in the graph. And as I said, you ensure that this is uh, an expander with some slack, and slack is uh, 38 here, okay? You can implement all of this in time proportional to one over phi squared, so in number by sense. And in fact, this uh, pooling has, has been used in all uh, expander decompositions. Uh, I would say like in all uh, variants of expander decompositions in, di uh, in the dynamic world. Here, we, we need to do more work. It's not uh, expander pruning for the induced subgraph, it's expander pruning for this graph with self loops. So we need to do more work to make sure that uh, everything works out, okay? So let's let's look at a very simple dynamic expander decomposition. And uh, so here, let's just reiterate what the goal is. I, I want to maintain a clustering of the graphs such that each cluster is a, an expander, right? And I, I'm, uh, I'm, I can have edge deletions and edge insertion and so on. And this number k of cluster may change, right? So initially I may have K clusters, but then some cluster splits and so on. So this K might increase or decrease depending on how I do things. Okay. So here's a like a very simple minded algorithm. In the first step, I just uh, do expander decomposition. And then uh, for each of these expanders, I, I invo invoke expander pruning, okay? And what I do is now, so what expander pruning tells me that at any point of time, this leftover part is a good expander with some slack, okay? So what do I do for the green parts? For the green parts, I do the following. I just declare everything to be a singleton, okay? And this is trivial in expander decomposition because this cluster, the singleton clusters are trivially good, well-linked expanders, so, okay? So, okay, uh, what happens with this kind of solution? So by property three of pruning, this property over here, or oh, actually property two, sorry, the records is bounded by the volume of P. So what is the records? The records again is the number of updates that you uh, have in the next level, right? So by making here everybody a singleton in this green part, I'm introducing a lot of intercluster edges. 
So all these intercluster edges will correspond to updates in the next level of the expansion hierarchy. But here I can bound it by the number of updates so far times this factor phi. This gives me an amortization. So if I what is the amortized recourse per update is going to be of something of order one over phi. I'm just like dividing by the number of updates. Okay. You can still actually obtain sublinear update times using this approach. Okay. You can still get something into the two thirds or something like this, but you will not get into the total one. So we need something more, and and there are more complications that uh, like we need to actually take care of in order to to get such a, a, a better update time. So basically, one way of viewing this, we can actually use well linkedness again because uh, our expanders are well linked, such that we can enforce only one over alpha recourse per update. And remember, this was uh, phi is something like one over n to the one. This was one one over poly logs, so it's much better. Okay, so and then we can once we have one over alpha, we can afford doing this for a bunch of number of layers, and just adapting the definitions accordingly, we can make sure that uh, we get the update time of n to the one. So this is like a very quick overview on how the dynamic exponential composition works. Okay, so let me uh, summarize. So in this talk, I try to tell you something about a fully dynamic, well-linked expander hierarchy, how to get a flow specifier from it, and how to update efficiently. And and this uh, can be a, this framework can be applied to many problems, including dynamic max flow, connectivity, sparse cut tree width, and so on. Some of the open questions here or some questions that uh, I'd like to think about, and I think they're very interesting. For example, is whether you can actually get dynamic tree flows pretty far with polylogarithmic quality. Right now, everything here, what I talked, is based on bottom-up clustering, which makes things nicer in the dynamic setting. If you do top-down clustering, then it's not so clear anymore. Actually, there is work where uh, a bunch of authors and I could do it for Bartle trees, but I'm not sure we can do this for cuts. Um, another important question is, for example, what about dynamic algorithm for specifier that preserve terminal cuts? With there, the approximation guarantees logarithmic, for example, in the number of terminals, not in the number of vertices. And these terminals can be much smaller. What about this question? I think we are far away from answering this. And Another important thing is now with all the max flow algorithms here kind of seem to use these embedding approaches, which is nice and give you something non-trivial, but the approximation quality is also fairly high. And our work was subpolynomial. In other works is polylogarithmic, the best known, or nearly logarithmic. So the main question is, can you actually get competitive uh, algorithms for max flow in, a, in the dynamic, from a dynamic point of view? We say like constant approximation one plus epsilon. Uh, thanks very much, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Carlos. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, let's give people a moment to see if they have uh, questions to write. Uh, and if, if people have a longer question, we can also put your, them on stage to, to ask. Um, maybe... While we wait for people, I'll ask a question. So, um, do 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 these weighted uh, sorry do these tree flow sparsifier techniques extend to weighted graphs at all? So yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, I think our dynamic algorithm doesn't. The static one would extend. Yes. Okay. And, and is there, there hope? Uh, I think. Okay, as far as I know, no, there isn't a hope to extend this to weight it for the, because you can have a lot of, you can have a lot of changes there which could mess up the things in the expanders. Okay. So I don't think so. But like by other means, like if you, if you look at the other work where we got like um, polylogarithmic uh, quality and distribution over J trees, for example, there you could do white. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And we have a question now in the chat. 
uh, we saw at the beginning that there is some lower bound for exact dynamic algorithms. Is there any lower bound or inside uh, how good approximate dynamic algorithms can be? Yeah, so thanks for the question. This is a great question. Um, there are very few uh, dynamic lower bounds for dynamic algorithms in the approximate setting. So the only ones that I'm aware of is shortest path. So for shortest path, you cannot do something better, say like three over two or four over three, something like this. Okay, but I I don't I don't actually believe that there is a lower bound for max flow. I actually believe that you can do a one plus epsilon, uh, epsilon approximate max flow in sublinear time. It's just a matter of like you know uh, doing it. But I don't know how to do it, but I think it can be done. And maybe even sub polynomial time. Uh, just sublinear, right? I just want one, one plus okay. epsilon approximation is just okay. n to the zero point nine nine nine. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Okay. But so is there an I obstacle that you cannot do for shortest path. Yeah. But you you can you because there you also have to pay this Spanner trade off somewhat. That's my intuition from distance oracles and so on. Here you don't have that problem. Because also, if you look from a sparsification point of view, we know how to sparsify flows better than how we know how to sparsify distances in terms of quality and so on. Um, OK, very good. Thank you. Um, and let me ask one more question. So um, yes. can you can you do dynamic max flow with arbitrary demands? if you have to satisfy the demands exactly, like so I'm ruling out some kind of direct reduction to approximate max flow via super source and a super sink. I think this one actually, if you wanna do it and, uh, via tree flow specifiers, you can do that. For any demand I, I can do, I can do congestion but, minimization using tree flow specifiers, yeah. And and but I guess what what I mean is, and you have to like be able to dynamically change the demands. Oh, okay, but this one is actually oblivious to demand, so you can come up with any demand you want. I will give you a good approximation to it. Unfortunately, it's going to be subpolynomial. So okay. changing demands, you you are allowed to do anything. I don't see the demands. These are these are all demand oblivious. Uh, I guess what I mean is it's not so clear to me what it what it means now. Like if uh, you know, I, I I have to be able to like um, somehow maintain a representation. Uh, like like it, you know, even just on a path, if I change the demand, the flow could be uh, like the flow could have a very large representation. Okay, the, so uh, okay, I'm saying I can give you a good approximation to the flow, the value problem. I'm not saying I can give you the flow. Okay, okay, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. giving you the flow, it's a different question. Because yeah. then you know you have to maintain these embeddings uh, efficiently, and that's where things get complicated. So. Okay, so something like that, but would it is it doable if you? Is, is I, I like haven't a... thought about it. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. Actually, maintaining the abandons seems sort of. I just haven't thought about it. I hear. Okay. I think here is just the whole, whole idea, like maintain the value problem under dynamic updates. But okay, so. Uh, so there, are, okay, there are cases where I can also give you the flow. There are algorithms where I can give you the flow in, in in time proportional to the size of the flow, right? But uh, that's not demand oblivious. That's just for fixed source and target. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's not demand. Okay. Well, what you're asking is uh, demand oblivious. And then, so this is demand oblivious, but it doesn't give you the flow. It just says that this is a good approximation, existentially, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. Very interesting. Thank you. Let's, uh, if, if we don't have more questions, let's uh, ask Graham, uh, thank Graham once again. Uh, thanks very much.
All right. And uh, I think Ming will end the session, but uh, mm -hmm. we have this, you know, if, if you want, you can stick around in the lounge and, and people can say hello. But I, uh, sure, sure, sure. Yeah.